pontiff, you have told us to come boldly to your throne of grace where we can find mercy. Oh God, and we are thankful that we can come even now. We are so thankful, oh God, for Jesus, the sinner's friend. We are thankful, Heavenly Father, for Calvary, oh God. Calvary have reclaimed us to you. We thank you, oh Father, for Jesus, for what he is doing now, oh God. You said in your word that he is in the holies of holies, oh God, ever living to make intercession for us. And we thank you, Father. We thank you sometimes, oh God. God, we don't have the words nor the expression to thank you, oh God, but with our breath, we praise, we thanks, and we glorify you because there's no other name like Jesus, the songwriter reminds us, that tells us that he is the sweetest name that we know, oh Father, and we thank you, oh God, that you have seen worth, you have seen value in us, and you have connected us with you because of Christ Jesus. This morning, we are so thankful to you that we can be in your sanctuary, worship you, uplifting you, magnifying your name, and praising your name, because you are a God that is worthy to be praised. You said in your word that you inhabit our praise, oh God, and we are so thankful for you, for the opportunity, oh God, that we can come and praise you. We don't have to praise idol that is made with hands, oh God, but we praise the creator of heaven and earth that made us, oh God. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you, oh God. God, we thank you for the blessings that you have given to us. We thank you, oh God, for even the blessings of chastening us, oh God, even when we were disobedient. Father, we know that you didn't do it because you wanted to hurt us, oh God. You did it because you want character reform in us. And we are so thankful, oh God, that you see such, you see such value in us, oh God. We are so thankful for the example that we have seen in your word, oh God. The Patriots and prophets, oh God, men and women that you have seen worth in and was willing to chasten, oh God, so that they can come into a saving relationship with you. This morning, oh God, we bring before you the youth. Oh God, there is a work for them to do as well. And we are so thankful that they can come into your sanctuary to, to worship you, to give of themselves to you, to be used by you. I pray that you will wash each of us from our sins, the stains, oh God, that separate us from you, and you will draw us into your embrace, oh Heavenly Father. We pray that you will use this youth, oh God, to reach other youth so that they can come into a knowledge of Christ Jesus. We bring before you, oh God, Pastor Sam. He have accepted the call to voice forth your message today. I pray, oh Heavenly Father, that you will calm his nerve. Oh God, you will give him the right words to speak to your waiting people, oh God. Use him. You said in your word, that in the last days, oh God, that you are going to pour out your spirit, oh God, upon our sons and our daughters, oh God. And this is the last day that we are in. And I pray, oh God, that the youth will avail themselves so that your Holy Spirit can be poured out in their lives, oh Heavenly Father. And so that their lives would be a difference when it compared to the life, oh God, with the youth in the world, I pray that they will get, oh God, on board and carry this gospel to a dying world because Christ Jesus is coming. So we pray, oh Heavenly Father, that as your word is being spoken, that our hearts, oh God, will be in tune our hearts will be changed by your word and men and women and boys and girls will come to call you blessed in jesus name we pray amen
children's story. So may all the little children please come to the front for the children's story. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. Come on louder. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. Today's story I'm going to tell you is about a young shepherd named Thomas. Do you guys know what a shepherd is? What's a shepherd? That is correct. Shepherd Thomas was a shepherd of a hundred sheep. Can you believe that? Could you guys take care of a hundred sheep? Okay. Thomas took care of a hundred sheep. He lived on the hill with his family, his two brothers and sister, and his mom and dad. And every day, Thomas would take the sheep out to the grass to feed and and t take them back. And when he would go, before he went, he would count the sheep, make sure there's all hundred of them. So he would come back, he will count them again. So one day, Thomas went up to take the sheep out to eat the grass. And he counted the sheep. He counted 99. He was like, huh? He counted again. There were 99 sheep. He had lost one sheep. Thomas was sad, and he wanted to find this other sheep. What would you guys do if you, lo if you were a shepherd and you lost a sheep? Eli? Christian? Okay. So Thomas set out to find this sheep. He put his ears out, tried to listen for the sheep cry, and even though he was so tired and it was hot outside, he made sure he found this sheep. And guess what? He found the sheep. And he was so happy. What did you think he did when he found the sheep? Christian? Uh-huh, Eli? All right. He picked the sheep up, he went back, put it back, and he called all his friends to celebrate. He was like, come on, I found my sheep, let's celebrate. So he was so happy. In the Bible, it says, there is joy like that in heaven, Jesus said, over people. I have come to look for those who have wandered away from God and bring them back home. I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. He never leaves his flock. He finds them fresh grass and leads them to water. He knows every one of his sheep, and he doesn't run off when a wolf attacks. The sheep follow their shepherd because they know his voice. I am the good shepherd. Those who follow me are my flock. They know me, and they trust me. I lead and protect them, and I am ready to die for them. 
the moral of today's story is that we are we are a flock and God is our shepherd and he wants to protect us and keep us safe and he loves us so so much there be is this, would anybody like to pray hey come Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for um, our blessings today. Thank you for the people that we honor and that we pray for. Amen. Amen. mind to do the operatory response at this time I invite you to join with me and let us give thanks in the sacrifice of our giving first we must give to God ourselves and secondly we'll give to God uh, those uh, those gifts that he has shared with us so that others can be blessed through our giving. I ask that this moment that our deacon and deaconesses please stand as we prepare ourselves to give up our full tithe on our free will offering. Let us pray. Eternal Father, we are grateful that you have been extra good to us throughout the course of the week. We thank you for your safekeeping. You have shared our life so that we were able to see uh, not a Sabbath day, and we give you thanks for this new day. We rejoice, dear Lord, in our praise and thanksgiving, and we acknowledge that it is you from whom we have received all things, because all things belong to you. We come now, dear Lord, with willing hearts to give liberally to the welfare of our fellow men. We ask, dear Lord, that uh, the offering that we give, that you will bless it so that it will go to the furtherance of your cause and that others will glorify your name because they would have witnessed the change that our giving would have made in your life. We ask, glorious Father, that you continue to bless those who do not have today. And may we find different ways to give if we do not have monetary gifts to give to you so that your work can continue and your kingdom expanse can be widened so that your coming will be welcomed by a people prepared to live and reign with you eternally. In Jesus' name we do pray with thanksgiving. Amen. about what I'm going to say about this song and really nothing nothing came to mind. I just felt like this joy come over my heart. And so I'm going to leave it to you all to, to not only listen but experience the words of the song. 
Um, I guess I'll just read my favorite part of the song, though. It says, and I'll testify of the battles you've won, how you were my portion when there wasn't enough. And I'll testify of the seas that we've crossed, the waters you parted, the waves that I've walked.
gift, such anointing. Amen, somebody? Amen. Lashona, keep it up. Keep staying at the feet of Jesus. Amen, somebody? Amen. One of the main reasons why we come to church is to hear a word from the Lord. That's one of the main reasons. Yes, we like to hear the singing. We like to hear the praise team. We like to hear even the children's story and so forth. Mm -hmm. We like the interaction with each other. But one of the main reasons we come to church is because we want the word of God deep down in our souls. Amen, somebody? And guess what? God is faithful in always appointing or calling somebody that he can use as his mouthpiece most mouthpiece and i believe that because god is faithful in in selecting his mouthpiece i believe that god desires us to be at a place where we are prepared to meet him in glory amen somebody and that's what the word of god does because the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of the Lord. And so we have in our midst one of my colleagues in ministry. And of course, you know, we spoke at length and it is his passion to share the word. It is his passion to, to engage the minds of young people. And God has called him from a tender age to the church. God has called him from a tender age to personal relationship with him. And God extended that call a couple of years ago or many years ago in calling God's servant, his servant, in pastoral ministry. We have Pastor Sam with us. He's from Downs do Seventh Day Adventist Church, where he's serving currently as the, the assistant pastor. But previous to that particular appointment, he was serving at the Willowdale Seventh Day Adventist Church as the assistant pastor. And of course, and of course, as the assistant pastor, is 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 is, is primarily also responsible for the nurturing of young people. All right, he's a young man. And um, is a native, and I would say a native from, from Montreal, and so he's bilingual. So if he's speaking in tongues up here, <laughs> he understands. Amen, somebody. <laughs> if he's speaking in tongues up here, don't, don't, don't be perturbed, right? Because he's not doing gibberish. Amen? He's speaking unto the Lord into his native language. And so he's bilingual, and I, and I, and I, and I really appreciate that in ministry. Um, and, and of course, his background is Sri Lanka. Amen, somebody? Amen. Amen. His background is Sri Lanka. And I believe that God has anointed him. He loves ministry, people, person, um, a very cool guy. You know, the man just cool, you know, just cool. And so God is going to use him today to bless us with a special message. But just before he comes, you know, God wants our hearts to be prepared with music 
-hmm. And music is designed to do such, to prepare our mind so that we can receive and assimilate the word of the living God. But And after, after they finish singing, the next voice that God will use is that of his servant, Pastor Sam.
to you, church family? Has God been good to you, church family? When we're in the house of the Lord, we're here to praise. Am I right? If God has been good to you, I want you to say amen. If God has been good to you, I want to hear you say hallelujah. If God has been good to you, let me hear you say praise the Lord. Church family, we here, we're here to serve God. Our sole purpose here on this planet is to serve God. Philadelphia, you are blessed. You are blessed. Youth, God bless you. God bless you. Keep going. Full steam ahead. This is, this is a blessing. Pastors, Pastor Parker, you're, you got a good group. You got a good, good group. Man, oh man, thank you. Thank you so much to all our participants today. Thank you, our musicians. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause for our musicians. Listen, music, I know, the, I know the struggle. I know what you guys go through, and I appreciate every single one of you. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you all so, so much. It's always so nice to be asked to speak on Youth Day because it reminds me that I'm still young. And I know it might be funny to hear that considering that there's no gray in my hair. But you know, recently, I've been told that I'm old by the younger generation. Apparently being a 90s baby is old now. So if I'm feeling old, imagine how Pastor Parker's feeling. Imagine how he's feeling. <laughs> but I need to thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor, for the invitation uh, to speak. We thank God nonetheless. I bring you greetings from Pastor King and the Downsview Seventh-day Adventist Church. And um, before I begin, I should introduce the people sitting beside me. Lulu, if you want to give them a wave. Lulu's my beautiful girlfriend. She's happy to be here, and I'm happy that she's here supporting me. And beside her, her, her sorry, in the, in the loud Hawaiian shirt is a good friend of mine, Akeem Ambrose, who I'm sure you guys may know already. I don't know where he's planning on going after Sabbath, but wherever it is, the shirt is appropriate. So <laughs> well, thank you once again. Thank you once again for being here, for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. But before I begin, I do want to put a little disclaimer slash invitation for any of you who might be interested. This evening, we are having a social gathering at the Crawford Adventist Academy gym. There'll be basketball, there'll be volleyball, there'll be uh, food for sale. So if you're not doing anything, from 7 p.m. to midnight, please feel free to come on down. I know that there's something else happening in the city. I don't know what it is, but uh, this weekend, is, something's happening. But we as Adventists, we, we, anyways, we don't, we don't worry about that, right? Oh, I didn't hear a big amen. Anyways, anyways, if you're free, if you're free, come on down and have some fun, have some fellowship. Amen? Amen, amen. Without further ado, let's jump right on into the word. I don't like to keep you long. I thought I'd hear an amen for that, but... I don't intend to preach for long, but I have a word for you today, and I want to jump right on in to it. Church family, there were a lot of things that I, that I dreaded to do as a child, or tried to avoid at all costs. You know, after supper, I dreaded doing the dishes. After school, I wanted to avoid doing my homework at all costs. And around the time to go to sleep, that's a good question. My mother would always ask me the question, why? I agree. I agree. You know, around bedtime, around bedtime, I wanted to avoid going to sleep. And then when I woke up, I wanted to avoid going to school. After a bad report card, maybe some of you may relate, I needed to avoid who? My father. And if I stained my clothes at school, I needed to avoid my mother. However, you know, avoiding things never really worked out in my favor. But one thing as a child that I told my, that I really, really, really wanted to avoid was wearing glasses. I hated the idea of wearing glasses, preacher. You know, just the thought of it would irritate my soul. You know, I had many friends who wore them at the time, and, uh, you know, it was just a hassle, right? It would get knocked off of their faces when we were playing sports. 
and they were always constantly cleaning them. And let's not forget uh, the fact that they were made fun of at times. That's right, four eyes, I heard it. I heard it. So as a, as a 13 year old boy, I made myself a promise. I said, Sam, you're never ever going to wear glasses. What'd I say? I said, you're never ever going to wear glasses. And I went on with my naive life. And when I remember, I remember this moment so vividly, I began grade eight, and I remember going to math class one day, and I sat in the front row, and the teacher began putting um, some math equations on the projector. And, you know, as I was looking at the numbers on the screen, something, something wasn't right. Something wasn't right. I couldn't quite distinguish the numbers that were on the wall. And as I was getting ready to raise my hand to ask the teacher to adjust the focus on the projector, because I was so sure that the problem was with the projector and not me, I noticed that my classmates were comfortable. They were copying the notes just fine. They were doing everything they were supposed to do. And I even tried asking the brother beside me, I said, hey, man, you see what's on the board? And he looked at me and said, wait, you can't? And that's when I realized that my eyesight was beginning to deteriorate. But what did I tell myself as a boy? I said, Sam, you're not going to wear glasses. It was not an option for me. It was not an option. So I decided that I was just going to have to deal with it. I was going to have to deal with it. So I began you know, getting into some habits of doing some little shortcuts, right? I'd, 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 I'd uh, copy off of my friend's notes, because I can see up close. I can't see far, right? I, I began you know, getting into the habit of squinting my eyes a lot and copying, you know, taking a picture, copying it off of my phone screen. You know, I even got my first watch in grade eight because I can no longer tell the time on the wall. So I had to get my first watch. Anyways, eventually I, I couldn't handle it anymore and I ended up getting glasses. But you know, I'll never forget the feeling I felt when I put on those glasses for the first time. It was as if I entered a, a whole new world. Sure, it was an uncomfortable feeling at first, but everything that I was seeing clearly made up for it. Going home, I was staring at the window, reading uh, words on billboards that I didn't even know existed. You know, I went home, I looked in the mirror, and I realized I wasn't as good looking as I thought I, I was <laughs> prior to the glasses. You know, it was crazy to me that I had avoided wearing glasses for so long. But what was even more mind-blowing was the fact that I had become accustomed to my blurry vision. I was so set on not getting glasses that I became used to seeing things blurry. I had settled for my poor vision. So my question to you today is, can you see clearly? Bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Loving Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity you've given us to meet together here in the house of the Lord. I thank you for just being present so far, and I just pray that you may open our hearts and our minds to understand what it is you have to tell us. It's my prayer in your name. Amen. The text I'd like to focus on today, church family, is found in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, and we'll be reading from verses 22 to 26. Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26. And as you turn there, let me give you a little background of what's been happening at the time. Now, prior to this text, Jesus had been going around doing what Jesus does, right? Healing many people and preaching the gospel. He had just healed the deaf mute. He had fed 4,000 people and was fresh off of dealing with the Pharisees' constant demand for signs. And prior to making it to Bethsaida, which is our setting for today, Christ had just scolded the disciples because they were worrying about starving because they hadn't packed much food to eat, completely forgetting about what Jesus had just done. 
So here we are, Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26. The word of God says, Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. The Bible says in verse 24, he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. So then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every one clearly. The last verse says, then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I really appreciate being able to see. People, people value their vision. That's no secret, right? It's no secret that people would rather see than not see. Some even going, go on and say that seeing is believing. Being able to see something or someone cements our trust and our belief. We depend on our vision for just about everything in life. There's no doubt why it's probably the most important of the five senses. You know, it allows us to walk freely to, and safely anywhere. It enables us to, to observe the beauty of life. It helps us do the things we have to do, love the people we claim to, and glance at the beauty of the world. However, this blind man did not have that privilege. This man found himself in Bethsaida, in an ancient fishing village in Galilee. And this morning, are we still in the morning? No, we're in the afternoon. This afternoon... I want to break down the story into three parts so that we can really understand it. And the first thing I want to focus on is what Christ first did. What's the first thing that Jesus did? He, he, he took this man out of the village. Why take him out of the village? I mean, the people of the village brought this man to Jesus to see something, did they not? But why take him out of the village? Well, it appears as so for Jesus to reveal himself to this man, he needed to take him away from the village. Now, I don't want you to miss this, brothers and sisters. Why? What is he trying to portray here? You see, Christ is always trying to open our eyes to see the splendor of his glory. He's always trying to show us who he is. However, sometimes he's not able to do that because we find ourselves in the city. I'm not talking about Toronto now. You know, he's unable to, to reveal himself to us because we still find ourselves in places that we shouldn't be in. You know, Jesus may be trying to walk us away from the city, but, but is unable to do so due to the people we surround ourselves with. He may be trying to tell you and I something, but isn't getting through the influences that are around us. He's trying to take you and I to a place of solitude where we have nowhere else to go but to him. But sometimes, church family, in life, we lose sight of God due to the, the people, the places, and the attractions of the city. You know, the world has such a vast and, and seductive pull that, that encompasses us. And Jesus is saying, listen, I can't open your eyes right where you are. We preoccupy ourselves with just about everything, and we fail to acknowledge Christ in it all. However, he can't show us who he is if we remain put in the village. He can't open our eyes if we don't want to turn away from what's distracting us from following him. And you see, the devil... Yeah, he's smart. You know, he's strategic. He has many ways of, of, of attracting us elsewhere instead of following Jesus. He has many ways of, of confusing our priorities. He has many ways of blinding us with things that we need to complete on a day-to-day -day basis that we just don't have room for Jesus anymore. 
And the, the, the society that we live in takes the need of Jesus away in our lives. And you know what? When we become consumed by what the world has to offer, that we fail to see the dire necessity for Jesus. You know, some of the greatest and most faith-growing times in our life will happen when we are completely alone with God. The world we, we live in is full of busyness and, attract and distraction. But when we are willing to be led by Jesus to a place of solitude, he will impress himself upon us in ways he might have not been able to with all that distraction and confusion around us. We see this in the way Christ gently leads this man where he would not have gone on his own. In the same way, family, we need to be willing to follow Jesus to, to, to special places of solitude for that spiritual renewal. We cannot fight it on our own or find excuses. Even today when he grips your soul, we need to trust him to lead us to a place that is good for us, even though we may not understand its benefit at the time. How many of you find it hard to make time for Christ? How many of us find yourselves distracted with just so many things? I'm here to remind us all how important it is to make time for Christ. I mean, we make time for just about everything else. We make time for our friends and family. We make time to, to, to go to the gym to make sure that we, we, we look good, we're healthy. We make time to eat. All good things, don't get me wrong, but God wants to be a priority in your life. But the thing is, he can't force that upon you. It's up to you. It's up to you and I to make that decision. To make time, to make him a priority. You know, it's interesting to me that Jesus told this blind man to go home without going through the village. Because something about this village would distract him. And, you know, sometimes we too find ourselves in circumstances that we shouldn't be in. And, and, and the devil is smart enough to try and trap us in the city. But praise God that we have a Savior who's willing to walk us out. Praise God that Jesus is willing to take us by the hand and lead us out of whatever trouble we find ourselves in. But the question is, are we willing to follow him even when we don't know where he's taking us? The text goes on to say that Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. To put things into perspective, this blind man followed Christ, a man who he probably didn't know too well but only heard things about, allowed him to take him by the hand outside of the village without being, without being able to see where he was going. You know, when I worked at summer camp many years ago, my first year, I remember that we had to train for um, a week called blind camp, where we'd have blind individuals, children of all ages, actually, to come, and we would, you know, cater to them, give them activities to do and whatnot. But there was a training period for the new staff, and here's what they did. In order to train us, they would cover our eyes and have other members on the team lead us around the campground and feed us just as we were to feed and lead the campers when they got here. And you know what? Not being able to see for those 30 to 40 minutes was probably one of the worst experiences of my life. I remember, you know, I was taking small, small strides and always gripping onto the person beside me hesitating before every step because I was afraid that I would bump into something or that I would fall, even though the people who were leading me were people that I knew. And I remember being extremely nervous when, when the blind campers were coming. And I was wondering, you know, how are these guys going to react to me, a person they don't even know? However, as soon as they got off the bus, they held on to me. They trusted that I would take them to wherever it is they needed to go. They trusted that I would take them to their designated destination safely. They trusted that I would feed them when the time was right. 
And that had me thinking. You see, these people didn't know what I looked like. They didn't know what background I came from. They didn't know where I was from, but they trusted that I would take them to where they needed to go. They trusted that I would do whatever it is they needed at the time. They trusted that I would give them their medication when it was time. And that got me thinking about my spiritual walk with God. If these individuals were able to trust me without barely even knowing my name, how much more should I trust a God who I claim to know and love? See, many of us, we stay in the village or we stay where we're comfortable because we don't know where Christ is taking us. And you know what? The thought of that is just frightening. We can't see what's down the road. So, you know, because I can't see, I'm going to just stay put. I'm, I'm not moving. But Jesus is trying to tell us that in order to see clearly, you need to follow me blindly. In order for you to, 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 to see things clearly, I need you to cling on to me, trusting in me that I will open your eyes when the time is right. But the thing is, Jesus isn't leaving us with no guides. His word is a constant guide to the lost. He gives us the opportunity to talk to him through prayer. He isn't leaving us high and dry, but has given us endless ways to communicate with him to build a relationship with him, and to get closer to him. But is that enough for you and I? Are we finding comfort in what the city has to offer or what God has to offer? Are we better off staying in our own comfort zone where we think we can see what we're dealing with? The final aspect of the text that I'd like to focus on is the fact that this healing took two phases. You guys ever noticed that? I mean, Jesus had healed many people throughout his life, right, preacher? He had healed many lepers with one touch. He made the deaf hear again with, with a word. The hem of his garment radiated with so much power that it healed a woman with an infirmity for many years. He was, he was powerful enough to speak life into Jairus' daughter from being miles away. Now, why would Jesus, who spoke life into Lazarus with just a few words, take two attempts to heal this blind man? Was Jesus not powerful enough to do it one shot? See, notice that the first time Jesus spat into and touched this man's eyes, his eyes were open, but he saw men as, as trees. He acknowledged the fact that he couldn't see clearly, and then Jesus touched him again. And sisters, Jesus is trying to show us that a relationship with him is a progressive process, not an instantaneous one. Jesus is saying that a, a relationship with me grows with constant communication and devotion. You see, when you first come to Christ, he opens your eyes. You know, you were blind, but now you can see. But can you see clearly? Or do we, like the blind man, see men as trees? You know, the bottom line is that we will never see the big picture with God right away. But it's through consistent relationship with him that we begin to see things differently with clarity. God is saying, listen, I don't want you to be stuck in that first phase of healing where your eyes are open, but you're unable to see with clarity. And just like I did as a child, you're beginning to settle for that blurry vision. No, no, no. That's not what he wants for you and I. Because when our vision is blurred and we become accustomed to that blurry vision, we begin settling for things that we know we shouldn't settle for. We begin settling for relationships we know we shouldn't settle for. We're settling for influences that we know we shouldn't be close to. You know, it's just one drink. That's all right. It's just a puff. That's all right. 
We begin settling for things that we know we shouldn't. We begin settling for things on the, doing on the Sabbath that we know we shouldn't be doing. And you know what? Let me take it one step further. You know, for those of us in Christ and things don't go our way, we begin to justify our disobedience to God. We allow the fact that we're disappointed in him justify our disobedience to him. We begin to justify our sin. Well, God, I only did this because I felt this type of way. I only did this to get back at her. We don't want to take that next step with Christ and further our walk with him because we think we have a pretty clear idea of who God is and what he can do for us. So we put him in a box. And you know what this does? This obscures our vision of God. We're in a blurry phase where we have one foot with God and one foot with the world. We're neither hot nor cold, and God is telling us to pick one. Either be for the world or be for me, but don't try to play both. And you know, God predicted that this would happen in the last days. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 to 18, he said to the church of Laodicea, I, You say I am rich, and I have required wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. But verse 18 says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Church family, God's desires include getting our attention so that we may turn and buy gold refined in the fire. His goal is to, to clothe us in white garments and anoint our eyes with eye salve. You see, you see, brothers and sisters, the, the Laodicean has the same problem. You know, they're blind to God at work in their life and in the, in the lives of other people. Why? Because they're blind, because they can't see. They're busy doing something else. But don't get me wrong, the Laodicean is not lazy. He's, he's, in, he's distracted by the busyness with the world, with, with getting ahead in life, with everything else rather than what they should be involved in, which is the things of God. But what does God want the Laodicean to do? God wants them to be zealous, not in the domain of, of making money or building profit or building their social character, but God wants them to be zealous for him. And here's the thing about a Laodicean. They pretend to be righteous. They've built a facade. You know, externally, they look like well-built good people and righteous too. But all the while, on the inside, there's something else. They're hypocritical. And that's, you know, one of the Laodicean's problems. They're so focused on other people and other people's problems and, and other things. They're not focused about themselves. And they cannot even see God. Since they have everything all figured out, all their needs and many of their desires are met, they in their heart of hearts believe that they don't really need God. But Christ's advice to the Laodicean is to get eye salve so that they can see. It's not so that they can see other people and their problems, but that they can see what's wrong with themselves. But more specifically, so that they can see God. God also wants them to produce righteousness so that they can put on that clothing representing pure character, so that they can purchase the spiritual riches that actually mean something, you know, the heavenly treasure that's talked about in Matthew chapter 6. One touch from God isn't enough, brothers and sisters. Choosing God is an amazing choice, and I'm almost out of your hair. Accepting him as your personal savior is one of the best things you'll do in your life. But maintaining a relationship with him is what's vital. God isn't calling you and I to be comfortable Christians. He's calling you and I to bear his witness, to be his witness, rather, and bear his testimony. He's, he's pushing us to leave our comfort zone and to do his bidding. 
Because only then can we have that gold refined in our lives. I don't want you guys to miss this part now. Jesus spat into this man's eyes and healed him with his literal salve. Some of us here may be in need for Christ to cleanse us with his spiritual salve. Some of us here today might be in need for him to touch our eyes a few more times so that we can see things clearly. And you know what? The reality is that some of us might be in need of some humbling to show us that we don't know the whole picture. It don't matter how long we've been serving in the church. It don't matter how much you know your Bible. It doesn't matter if you can tell us the prophecies by heart. Some of us are in need of some humbling. Some of us are in need for Jesus to spit in our eyes. And the reality is, I don't know if I'm speaking for any of you, but I'm speaking for myself when I say that I'd rather have Jesus spit in my eyes as many times as it takes than spit me out of his mouth because I'm lukewarm. And you know, what's interesting about this blind man is that he was able to see once upon a time. He was able to distinguish men as trees, which shows us that he had vision at one point but lost it. But Jesus performs this incredible miracle, the restoring of the physical sight of this man. And, you know, on its own, the miracle reveals the power of Jesus and his compassion to those in need. But the context of the healing and the way Mark shares this miracle makes it clear that Jesus also intended for this miracle to serve as an illustration, first for his disciples and by extension, us today. We are all born spiritually blind. And, and Jesus is the only one who can cure that blindness. How many of us have lost our vision? How many of us have lost sight of why we started in the first place? Maybe you got baptized and you were excited to, keep, to, to start living for God. You had all this power, all these ideas, but people shot you down and now you just have no strength no desire to keep going. You lost sight of why God called you in the first place. But the beauty of God is that he doesn't care about how long you've been in the dark. He doesn't care about the mistakes that you've made. He doesn't care about how far you've gone astray. He wants you just as you are. Friends, we shouldn't settle for our spiritual blurriness because there's a plethora of things that God wants to show us. There's so many secrets that he wants to reveal to you and I, but what he needs is a willing participant. You know, in life we see, sometimes we see life as a dimly lit mirror. And you know, dimly is the Greek word for which the English word enigma comes from. And do you guys know what an enigma is? It's a mystery. It's a puzzle. It's something difficult to understand. And right now, many things might be difficult to understand in your life. But you know what? You and I are like the blind man after Jesus applied his spit. Things are blurry. Things are blurry. And we are in need to go to the feet of Jesus just one more time. We might be in need of a second touch. I am in need of a second touch. I'm in need of that daily. Every single day, I'm in need. And if you recognize that you may be in need of God to just touch you one more time, if you recognize that you might be in a phase where, you know, things aren't as clear as they should be, I want to invite you to stand with me. 
want you to stand because everyone else or the people beside you are standing. I want you to reflect on your life. Reflect on the people around you. Reflect on the influences around you. Reflect on where you are in your life right now. Are you in need of Jesus to touch you one more time? Are you accustomed to seeing things blurry? Have you gotten accustomed to that? And I'm going to take it one step further. If you realize that you've been seeing things a little blurry, and if you realize that there's a need to make a commitment or to make a recommitment, I just want to invite you to come forward so that I can pray with you. No pressure or anything. All heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. If you feel that God is trying to tell you something today. If you feel as though God is saying, come home. It doesn't matter what's happened in the past. It doesn't matter the mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter the people you've hurt. What matters is that you recognize where you are right now in your life and you're saying, God, I need you to spit in my eyes. I need you to touch my eyes so that I could see you clearly. I want you to come forward. I want to pray with you. That's a big decision. That's a big statement. some of us are in need of some humbling. Some of us are in need of some guidance. Some of us are in need to see things clearly. have recognized that they may not see things the way you want them to, they, that they are around certain things, certain people, certain influences, that their vision has become obscured and that they are settling for that, but they want you to clarify their vision. Lord, we're all in need for you to touch us one more time. And I just pray that you may do just that. And you know what? We recognize, we understand that that might be painful at times. That there may be certain people that we need to let go of, certain influences that we need to come away from. But the fact that we're here today shows us, shows you that we're willing to do just that. We are willing, Lord. We are here today so that you can take us to the next level. We are here today because we know we can't see things clearly, but we want you, Lord, to clarify our vision, to give us the prescription that we need to see you, not 
not to see others, not to see what's wrong with their lives, but to see you. Because we realize that when we see you, nothing else matters. When we see you, the things of this world will grow strangely dim. When we see you, we will be content in you. And whatever comes our way, we will stand firm in the foundation of your love. Be with us, Lord. Help us prioritize you above everything in our lives. As hard as it may be, as busy as we are, help us understand and remember that if you are a priority, then everything else doesn't matter. Our stress level would diminish because we have you first and foremost. Spit in our eyes, Lord. Touch us one more time. Help us see you clearly. Is my prayer in your name.
Amen. Amen. What do you say? Glory to his name. I'm glad I was here today. Amen, somebody? What a powerful message. What a wonderful word that God gave us. And what wrapped it up nicely is that beautiful song, Glory to His Name. Amen. Amen. Glory to the name of Jesus. Pastor Sam, I just want to thank you in a special way, man, for allowing God to use you in the way he did today. And I believe that we have learned something. I believe that we have something to walk away with. And I'm not talking about adults alone. I'm talking about even young people. Youth among us have gotten something from the message that really resonated deeply in their hearts. I know for me, definitely, 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 the message resonated well with me. We're talking about that, 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 that progressive relationship that we have with Jesus. Because the Bible says the path of the just is like a shining light that shines more and more unto a perfect. And sometimes God doesn't give you everything at once. It is progressive. I'm really blessed by that. Because that can give me a certain level of patience that I need as a child of God. And I believe it's not just me alone have something that we walk away with. But I'm going to invite Elijah to come. Elijah to come. Um, he's a youth in our midst. You know, one of the outstanding youth in our midst. And he sat at the back. And he listened to you, Pastor Sam. And he, and he heard the voice of God through you. And he received something or some things deep down in his heart. I'm going to use this brief moment for him to, to just kind of reflect that. And so, Elijah, I want to thank you for taking the time and for listening to the sermon. And of course, he's just a representation of the many young people online and those who are in our midst who listen to your message intently. So I just want to find out, um, Elijah, um, what is it? What is it? N name at least two things you have received from this message as, as takeaways. And tell us why. One, one, one at a time. Okay. okay. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Um, probably one of the biggest things that I took away from the sermon was how the pastor said that our relationship with Christ is progressive and that it's not instantaneous and how we should always be working towards becoming closer with Jesus because there's always something more that we can learn and something more that we can get from our relationship with him. Mm -hmm. uh, wow, that's powerful, yeah, that's powerful. But, but uh, any other reason why you like that point? Uh, like personally, yeah, yeah. I like it because some people or lots of people think that there is a certain stopping point mm -hmm. when, they, when you're growing your relationship and that there's a point, there's like a peak, but it's more like an ever-growing mountain. Where yep. It, it <laughs> Absolutely. Stop. Absolutely. Growing in Christ continues. Amen. That's powerful. That's powerful stuff. That deep stuff. All right. So, so, so name something else that, that, you know, share another point that really resonated with you and you're going to walk away with that today. Mm -hmm. um, another point would, have, would be how you shouldn't be comfortable with blurry vision. Wow. Mm -hmm. Tell us why. Yeah. Uh, because having blurry vision is, if there is a way to get better vision through Jesus, you should always try and find it, and you shouldn't be comfortable with negative aspects of your life, and always yeah. try to work to be better. Yeah, definitely. Powerful, powerful. Never be comfortable with the negative aspects of our lives, right? We need to con continuously growing in Jesus, and we should ask God to, to make our eyes clearer 
as we continue on this path. We got settling for a blurry vision that will lead us to a place of more compromise, more at a place where we are deviating from the path of righteousness and God wants us to meet him in glory. So I just want to thank you very much for that, um, Elijah, um, for, for those two wonderful points. And, um, and I'm glad that you are able to, you are able to sit and, and really assimilate that. Thank you very much and God bless you. All right. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to invite um, the elder to come and then he's going to um, do the benediction and then we're going to hear the final song that will take us out. All right. Amen indeed. It has been a blessing to be here with you today. Once more, it has been a blessing for me to be here with you today. Indeed, the uh, message uh, resonates with me. I was blessed to have listened, and I'm grateful that you were able to join with me today as we worship our God and our Savior. Indeed, he has sent us a word to remind us that indeed we need to see him with clarity. And the only place to see him with clarity is to be in a consistent relationship with him and be anchored in the foundation of his love. I pray that as you go from here that you will leave with a blessing that will stay with you uh, throughout the week and throughout the days to come. At this moment, I would like for you to, I would like to thank the, the uh, online audience for being with us and for joining us um, from week to week. This place is a place of blessing, a place of hope, and it is a place that you ought to be on every given occasion. I thank the audience that's before me for always being here, for coming out and making this place a place of fellowship, a place of family, and a place where we always desire to be because it makes love uh, the our heart of uh, our worship and its community that we crave and we live for and God commissioned us to care for one another to be with one another and we have obeyed that command and in that command we have received a blessing at this moment we'll now I'll ask you to stand as we close in benediction your heads are bowed the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore Just before um, they sing this beautiful song, I just want to remind us that next week is camp meeting, and um, it's mostly on, it's online. And I just want us to also understand. We want to go through with the recommendation of the conference to keep the doors of the church open. That's a recommendation we receive in a special meeting this week. Week to keep the doors open, and we will show um, the service of the, the services of the camp meeting on our. AV equipment, our screens here, so to speak, for persons who are unable to access um, the service online. You can come, the doors will be open, and you will be able to view the service on the screen. I just want us to, to bear that in mind. And for those who are interested in the soccer, remember to connect with me. Thank you, and God bless.